The special meeting of the Board of Education for February 8th, 2018 is called to order. Everyone, um, welcome to everyone present and to our TV viewers. Uh, this meeting is being televised live and will be replayed throughout the next two weeks. Please check the board website for replay times. This meeting is also being streamed live on our PPS TV uh, services website. This evening, the board will be voting on the ratification of the 2016-2019 Portland Association of Teachers PPS contract. When the new school board was installed last summer, one of our priorities was to reach an agreement with our teachers. We knew this was important if we wanted to unlock a new relationship with teachers in our district. And this was going to be essential if we were going to work together to better support and prepare our students for college, career, and life. As was noted earlier this week, the Portland Association of Teachers ratified this contract on Monday, and tonight the Board of Education will consider and vote on ratification. The resolution we are considering has been posted publicly. In addition, the contract has also been posted publicly for the last three days. In my engagement with the district over the last two decades, final contract language is usually available weeks after the ratification vote. Both the PAT and PPS leads spent many hours drafting language throughout the process, with, and I applaud both Laird and Marty uh, for that work, um, to have it ready for us uh, for the ratification by PAT, and then for us to be able to share the language with the broader community. Um, so it's been available and posted so the community and media can review since Monday. As I said, that hasn't normally been the past practice. Um, so community members and media had, have an opportunity to review the contract and ask questions about the impacts. Um, there have been those that have requested for us to delay today's vote. Um, but we've been at the table for more than 20 months. and. The strong sentiment from this school community was that PPS should not move to unilaterally implement its contract terms, and there was not a desire for a strike either. A clear message um, that we received, um, I think not just me, but other uh, board members um, and staff, was that um, from parents and teachers, which was work it out, find common ground. And I think we've, we've done that. And from my perspective, we've reached a point in the mediation with PAT that this was the agreement that would lead to a settlement, and that both sides made compromises to get here. I say that as someone who only joined the discussions recently since being elected to the board, but the last four months have included comprehensive and deep discussions on issues of importance to both teachers and the school district. So delay is not going to change the agreement, um, but tonight we will have a full discussion, surface questions about the agreement, and then have a vote. As I said earlier, this bargaining began about 20 months ago before Directors Moore and Bailey and I were on the board and before Superintendent Guerrero was hired as superintendent. The PPS bargaining team that, um, that started almost completely switched out from the start to the end. Um, it started with interest-based bargaining, shifted to mediation, and ended with a collaborative and professional process to get to an agreement where both sides gave something to reach an agreement because reaching an agreement this time was the right thing to do for our students and our teachers and our school community. On behalf of the board, I would like to recognize and thank the members of the district bargaining team, our lead negotiator, uh, Laird Cusack, and team members, Kylie Rogers, Jen Thomas, principals Curtis Wilson, Kath and Kathleen Elwood, and a special thank you to senior, senior leader Antonio Lopez and to Director Constam, who um, were there from the very beginning um, to, to the end um, at 3.30 in the morning. I um, also want to thank um, Director Moore and um, Superintendent uh, Guerrero, who joined the bargaining teams and spent many nights discussing issues, again, both that were important to both um, the school district but also to our teachers. I also want to recognize PAT President Suzanne Cohen and the PAT bargaining team for the spirit in which the agreement was reached. Both sides were fierce advocates for their positions, ideas, and perspectives, but we were able to find common ground on some important issues that will be positive for our students and our teachers. Other issues we're going to have to save for another, another day. Um, so at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Superintendent Guerrero, um, who was um, he was a late arrival, but he was a catalyst to get us over the, over the, the finish line. Um, I'd like to ask you to provide some an overview of the contract, maybe your, your perspective um, on what it means for students and um, our teachers and our school community and other perspectives on um, the outcome of our bargaining. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for those of you who are here physically present and to our listening audience. Uh, this is on a very special episode, for those of you who remember TV in the 70s. Uh, tonight's special session, uh, I think, is momentous. I, I want to extend my gratitude 
uh, for their persistence to the same collection of people uh, for whom this has been a journey, uh, particularly for, for some members of, of the teams. Uh, but what I wanted to be able to start off with tonight, since Chair Brim Edwards has really laid out the context nicely, is a high-level overview what highlights of our uh, tentative agreement looks like, which we're really happy to hear that uh, Portland Association of Teachers has, has ratified this positively. So we're, I'm going to jump right into a presentation uh, that uh, talks about some themes that are in this agreement. Um, so I'm going to move to some of the key features, um, new and improved, more. Uh, you'll notice in the document it's it's 150 pages long, so I'm going to do my best to, to summarize it in eight to ten slides here uh, at a high level. Uh, but one thing that's that's really important, aside from the quality, just having more time for instruction, for teaching and learning to take place. Uh, so there's some features of that in, in the bargaining agreement. And then there's some aspects of increasing instructional time that aren't necessarily things that as a district, you know, are, are, are bargaining. Uh, items and so um, it's important as an educator uh, to really promote making sure we have high quality teaching and learning time for our students and so one thing I want to make sure that the broader community understands is we also have an opportunity through our school calendar and our daily schedules to increase that time so while it won't be found in our contract um, features that uh, create a more family-friendly schedule um, like elimination of late starts or early releases are going to substantially increase the kind of time that our teachers have to have uninterrupted instructional days is, is going to be a feature moving forward for school year 18-19. But in the contract we did find opportunities to, to increase on that time as well. And it's time for student learning but also time for teacher learning. Um, so time that's dedicated for professional learning, particularly in themes or areas uh, that are important to, to both of us, uh, where we know as a school system we need to place some emphasis uh, in areas around how to better understand and serve our diverse learners, for instance, or our students with special needs. And we know for our educators, for our professionals to do their best work, they need time together. They need time uh, to do some planning, to be prepared in their lessons. And so this agreement affords them a little bit more time each day to be able to do that. I would say one thing that people probably is getting a lot of attention here is that uh, class size matters. Um, we want to make sure that the ratio of adults to students allows for differentiation to occur that as teachers uh, aim to be thoughtful about how to serve the diverse learners, whether they have disabilities or English learners, or from subgroups that maybe aren't finding themselves at grade level, that there's an opportunity to do that. And so as we think about class size, while we haven't uh, identified a maximum capacity, we have said there's a certain point where we should acknowledge that uh, it has a workload bearing. And so we've called that a threshold. And what we've proposed to do is to acknowledge any time there's additional students beyond that threshold and recognize that in a differential for our classroom teachers. For our specialists, they also see a lot of students, and that also matters. And so caseload for many of our special load also makes a difference, and we've set out some goals for that too. So this agreement lays out a table, K to 12, and for many of our specialist roles, uh, what we believe those uh, more doable caseloads uh, uh, might look like. We spent a lot of time uh, at the table talking about uh, a particular area where we know as a school system we need to lend a lot of attention in evolving our service delivery mo model for special education students. And so uh, we've outlined some ways that we want to make sure and put an emphasis on that. Uh, that includes making sure that as students' disabilities get identified that we offer uh, the right level of program seats to meet their needs. And if you're going to offer a full continuum, sometimes that support happens in a more inclusive fashion, and sometimes we need to make sure and offer those programs um, throughout our school portfolio. And then last but not least, we know our educators didn't go into this business uh, because of it. It matters uh, to show respect and acknowledgement in the way of compensation increases. And so a feature of this contract does include those compensation increases, a total of 8% uh, going back to 2016-17, uh, which will be retroactive, including for this year. Um, so uh, that is a feature in here. The school calendar, uh, this is 
obviously an area where a lot of families would, would have interest. Uh, we have added an additional day for school year 1819. Prior to this contract, we were operating at 176 days. Uh, 177 now puts us a little bit more at the median with surrounding school districts, but that additional day allows us to, to incorporate that much more learning time for our students. If you think about the additional day and you think about the recaptured instructional time by making sure that each and every school day starts at the same time, uh, that accumulation results in a lot of additional hours for uninterrupted core instruction to take place. So we're looking forward to being able to plan accordingly. The work calendar would also be a day longer for our educators because of all the themes and the priority areas that we agreed that we needed to work on, we need time to do that professional learning. So uh, there'll be an additional day uh, for our educators to come together and, and receive that kind of training and learning and hopefully we can collaborate on sharing those promising practices. Uh, we anticipate that this is an additional day that would happen at the front of the school year so we can front load some of that time uh, before the start of the school year. The additional time for teachers to plan, there's an extension of 15 minutes in this contract for four days of the week, that seven and three quarters hour workday, um, also more in line with some of our surrounding districts, but this does result in a gain of 60 paid uh, planning time uh, minutes uh, per week for our educators to, to actually be prepared with their lessons for the students that they serve. Speaking a little bit more on the student and caseload goals, what it does here is it does set about a clear set of thresholds for our students and, and class size K through 12, um, and also acknowledges that we have a lot of specialists that obviously see a lot of students throughout the course of their work week. Um, and while those are goals, we also wanted to make sure that there were some remedies uh, whenever we go over that uh, desired goal. And so one is obviously to balance the class sizes across multiple teachers where that's possible. Uh, a second option is to m assign additional personnel who can support classroom learning and teachers. Or as a third option, that we recognize that uh, threshold uh, going over by uh, affording a, a, a stipend to the teacher of that classroom or the specialist who goes beyond their caseload. I spoke about the special education support briefly and, and the commitment we want to make to continuing to work on our service delivery model and uh, really uh, uh, making sure that we offer a high quality full continuum of options for our students with disabilities. We also know it makes a difference, uh, particularly uh, some folks might think that in a substantially separate classroom where you have fewer students that adding one more, you know, what's one more? Well, when you have 10 students who uh, experience a more intense level of need and in specialized instruction, uh, that additional student really makes a difference. Uh, uh, and so we want to recognize and do our best to maintain a manageable caseload there. We also recognize that a lot of our students are showing up at school uh, with readiness to learn challenges. Uh, we have a lot of students who are experiencing trauma. Uh, they're arriving at our front door, and clearly there's a, uh, there's a need for some social emotional support um, and some immediate case management. Uh, just in, in taking a look at a, a, a quick analysis of where we're seeing many of these instances, many of them are happening with kindergartners, uh, surprisingly. Um, what we do know is that we need an ability and a capacity to respond in those situations so that our teachers are not left alone to figure out how to support students who are demonstrating uh, some of these more intensive needs. So this is, a, this is an area where there was a lot of agreement around how do we do that in a thoughtful way. And if we're going to have a team that's able to respond in a rapid fashion, what kind of versatility and personnel do you need on a team like that to better meet the needs of students who get identified? Uh, this is a feature that was identified previously uh, in, in an agreement, and it hasn't come to full fruition, but it's one that we're committed to, to making sure uh, is available there to our teachers. It's also important to recognize that the response isn't just there for our students. It's also there to act in consultation with our educators. Teacher compensation, um, pay increases, uh, 
3% retroactive for the 2016-17 school year, uh, and 2.75 uh, since July 1st for this school year. That's hopefully our teachers very quickly, you know, pending tonight's decision, we can get to work on processing some retroactive uh, checks for, for our teachers. And I know you can't see it there for 18, 19, we're not hiding a, a big number all of a sudden, uh, but that represents a 2.25% COLA for the coming school year. Uh, the total of those three years comes to 8% in this three-year agreement. What's all that gonna cost, you ask? Uh, well, we have uh, our best estimates here. Uh, recalling that uh, for the last two years, this have kind of been integrated into our ongoing budgets. Uh, the 7.3 for 16-17, 14.2 for this year. And if you take into account the compounding costs uh, of the contract agreement, that would come to about 27 million for the coming school year. Obviously, that's something we're gonna have to uh, prioritize right off the top as we go about our budget development season that is commencing now. Most important, I want to highlight and end here with, with this slide, is uh, I think there's a lot of features in there that we came to compromise around. Uh, but more important to anything you'll find in this document that I think many of us appreciate, especially uh, for those folks who have been part of the history in this district and for those of us that are educators, I think, and I think I can say authentically, is uh, a renewed opportunity to engage in a collaborative relationship between school district administration, uh, with our rank and file educators who are the ones who are in front of our students each and every day. Uh, without supporting them and allowing them to do their best work, uh, we just won't get to take it to the next level. I am looking forward to this refreshed relationship. Uh, relationships take work and commitment. Uh, that's what we're committing to here, but I'm very excited and optimistic about the remaining challenges that we agree we need to take on, and I'm looking forward to taking those on together. Thank you. Board, that uh, here, here. summarizes my highlights uh, and features for the contract. We have staff here on deck. We anticipate you're gonna have much more detailed questions, so we're ready to take those. Thank you, and um, I appreciate that uh, I was just sort of ticking through my list of questions, and uh, you've knocked some of them out, so um, appreciate that. and. I think it's a, a great summary of 20 plus months of work. Um, I think instead of going to questions, um, I, let's get the motion on the table um, first, and then we can have questions and discussion. Uh, so the board will now consider resolution number 5569, the 2016-2019 agreement between the Portland Association Teachers and School District number 1J, Multnomah County, Oregon. Do I have a motion? So moved. Director Constan moves and Director Rosen seconds the motion to adopt resolution 5569. Um, we need to do one more thing with the resolution. We need to make a slight amendment to it um, that uh, you should have in front of you a red lined version of the, um, of the resolution. And we're striking a um, couple lines. We're striking, striking the words superintendent is authorized and directed to execute and the words um, on the terms presented to the board and filed in the record of the meeting. And what we're gonna do is we're just adding some language to allow for, um, although, although Laird and Marty were diligent uh, scribes uh, and got it all ready, it's 156 pages and we recognize there's some formatting um, and other issues, um, some things that need to move around. So uh, we we're at, gonna add some language that will allow them to make sort of non-substantive non changes in the formatting and moving things around. So I'm gonna just read the resolution as that we're going to consider here tonight. I know you have it all uh, in front of you, but I wanna just read it for the record. Um, the 2016-19 agreement between the Portland Association of Teachers representing licensed personnel and school district number 1J, Multnomah County, Oregon, as provided to the Board of Education is adopted and approved, and payments on the agreement is also thereby authorized subject to any required future board action. The superintendent designee is authorized to make technical corrections to the agreement in order to correct typographical and spelling errors, make formatting changes, or renumber provisions so long as the intended meeting of the agreement is not thereby altered. Such technical corrections shall be reported to the board at the next available opportunity. So I'd like a uh, motion to um, move the um, amended language. Second. 
So Director Rosen moves and uh, Director Moore seconds um, the amended version of resolution number 5569. Oh, Karen, I didn't, we didn't, we should have voted on the underlying resolution first or do we? The amendment. Okay, so, so now we're gonna vote on the amended language and then we go vote on the mm -hmm. underlying language. Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask uh, for a board, board vote. Um, this is to just get the resolution on the table, um, the, the amended resolution. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, Representative Tran? Aye. The motion passes by seven to zero vote with uh, rep student rep Tran voting aye. S sorry, six to zero. Um, so now we're going to put the motion on the, so, um, We're not voting on the, f uh, excuse, excuse us. Um, we're uh, Representative Esparza, or Director Esparza Brown is out of town this evening and wants to participate in the vote, but I think um, we're just putting the motion on the table. Um, <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> um, maybe when we get to close to wrapping up. Um, so now we're gonna vote on the um, putting the motion on the table. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those we opposed? Have we, we, oh. have we have to vote. That was on the, the amendment. This is the regular. This is the regular. We're not gonna have discussion. No, we're not. Yeah, we're yes. So thank you for not voting. Okay. <laughs> you were right, Roseanne. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, the amendment threw me for a loop. So we have the amended resolution before us. Okay. So at this point, I would like to ask um, board members if um, if you let's, let's start with questions, and then uh, from there we can uh, people want to make some uh, remarks or um, observations or statements um, about their vote. We can have time for that. So with that, um, any questions for the superintendent or the district bargaining team? Dr. Um, Whaley? I need to make a statement first that uh, because my wife is a proud member of the Portland Association of Teachers, I have a conflict of interest. I spoke with the Oregon School Board Association about this. This is apparently fairly common throughout the state. Um, and the practice is uh, everywhere else is to declare the conflict and then to go ahead and vote anyway. Thanks. Did you have any questions? Um, I, I would like some clarification. I wasn't on the bargaining team, so I didn't hear the conversation um, around the um, files, personnel files. Um, so what's in and what's out, and uh, why, why some of the language was added uh, to the contract, um, and, and also what it doesn't. Yeah, I, I mean, there's uh, some people can't talk about some things, uh, but others can. So just some clarification on I, around that. I can that. understand, Director Bailey, why you want to be clear on that. This is an area that's garnered quite a bit of attention. So. Well, we have our chief negotiator and chief of talent and culture here this evening. Hopefully they can illuminate this. So uh, in regards to the, uh, there's language in the uh, contract about investigation files and personnel files. Uh, personnel files contain uh, the action, personnel actions that are relate to the particular employee. The investigation files um, are files that we keep and have all the evidence and uh, documents and uh, information that is gathered during an investigation. Uh, that includes the, if the person is put on uh, paid administrative leave, and th those files are not, do not become part of the personnel file. And there is specific language in the contract regarding the personnel files. The investigation files we actually hold separately and, and have, um, in fact, every place I've worked, we hold those, we always held those files separately. 
On your second question regarding who can speak or not, if I, have I answered the first question? Um, so has this been past practice in Portland Public Schools, or how has how it worked, and what's the, the change in practice? There, uh, to my knowledge, there's not a change in practice. The, the documents that we, we certainly didn't bargain a different practice with the union. Uh, the personnel files that we uh, are being kept the same way they were prior to this bargain. Okay, thanks. Now the second question you had about who can speak and not? Correct. Okay. Um, the, the, the union had raised that um, a concern that uh, sometimes when their members were placed on paid administrative leave that the um, information coming uh, from the, the local uh, administrator um, was uh, inconsistent and um, and sometimes problematic. What we did is we addressed that that concern by allowing the administrator to be able to uh, tell uh, those who may need to know in the cases of criminal conduct or child endangerment or violence, be able to tell those those people that the uh, employee was not at the building and to respond that the employee was not at the building if asked. The agreement only deals with administrators. It does not in any way uh, limit the district's ability to uh, make statements or provide information that it chooses to do so from senior management and the board or the superintendent. And if I could just add, I think that this language for both the district and the Portland Association of Teachers is important as we think about the district balancing its obligations to ensure due process with its obligations on public interest. And student safety is always the first consideration. Go ahead. If I could ask a follow-up question, uh, Ms. Large. How does that uh, treatment of the personnel files square with public records law? Uh, Director Anthony, I think it is um, consistent with how we have proceeded uh, and understand where we are in somewhat of a state of flux. And as you know, the district is currently in litigation trying to get clarification on some issues of public records law. But um, I think that the, I think we've struck that balance here as we're waiting for some definitive court ruling as well. Since you bring up uh, litigation, what flexibility is there, uh, what ability is there in the contract and with the relationship with the union to renegotiate this if it uh, goes opposite the district's position? Uh, I think that the union and the district both have a clear understanding of where that case is and its posture and have forged a path to work together. Um, if, we're dealt, if there's a decision from the court that makes it impossible to comply simultaneously with the agreement and with um, public records law, that being said, I would ask Laird to comment further if there's any further color on the negotiations. It's a very delicate issue that we want to get right. The, the contract itself does not deal with um, the public records law. The only agreement that we have uh, as part of this bargain is that when the district uh, has its next draft of the policy, that it will in fact send a copy to the union and the union will have it, their rights under state law uh, to demand a bargain. There is no, we didn't provide them any more rights than is allowed under, under the existing uh, Collective Bargaining Act. Okay, so, so then to summarize the, lang the, the newer language around this is issue, clarifies current practice well the, the uh, in terms in terms of uh, what goes into an investigative file and what goes into a personnel file is that correct well there actually to my recollection isn't any language in here about differentiating those except for 
that the administrative leave letters right. will go yeah. into the investigation file, which I thought was our practice. Um, and um, and it would be appropriate because we there are investigations which have no findings and those would not end up in a personnel file. Uh, so we, you know we don't take any action because we find that there is nothing to act on. The actual personnel article, um, really the change in the article was to clarify educators' ability to get their file and to uh, clear up a, a dispute that uh, language had caused regarding the association's access to the personnel files. Um, we didn't make other, um, other changes um, the, um, other than when we uh, did the letters of expectation um, formatting, which are um, expectations that do not have any finding of wrongdoing. They are specifically an expectation that those will be rotated out of building files after three years. And, and as somebody who is an employee and has had to deal with it from the employee side, I, I appreciate the. It, it it goes both ways. <laughs> I've I've been on the on that end of the stick, so to speak. Can I? Um, Are you going to go on? Excuse me. Are you going to go on a different topic? Because I was no. going. Okay. Then I'll. Let you um, go Okay, so I was on the bargaining team, and so I, I had the privilege of um, sitting through very long discussions um, about these about these fairly technical um, issues, and where language is exquisitely nuanced um, in a contract. Um, so I'm going to put it in plain language, because I think this is these are the questions that we're getting from parents and community members. In light of um, a number of unfortunate instances um, of, uh, th that have become known um, where student safety was jeopardized, um, how can parents and students and teachers and community members feel reassured that similar situations are not going to occur? What actions can we take and have we taken, um, w either within the contract or outside the contract, to ensure that student safety remains paramount? Well, um, I, at the most basic level, um, the employee relations team is now actually staffed, fully staffed at four people. My understanding that that has not been the case for uh, longer than anybody can identify. Um, and so there are, we now have resources for uh, administrators who uh, run across these issues. We have made a very clear uh, assignment of, of, of uh, the staff to make sure that administrators have access and know who they need to contact. We're working our way forward now that we have this agreement to go uh, and, and produce a investigations uh, and discipline uh, procedures manual and go out and do training for our administrators and make sure that administrators have the tools they need both to recognize the issues that they need to raise and to be able to conduct those investigations with our assistance. Um, I, I think that having looked at some of the prior cases and somewhat cases, our practice was not consistent and people slipped through the cracks. And the most important aspect of uh, dealing with individuals who should not be in our school system or uh, need corrective action is to have a consistent practice of investigation, correction, and discipline. Um, there really were no, um, the district 20 months ago uh, really had not made any uh, proposed changes in the sections regarding building files. Um, th those were issues we could raise in the next negotiations. Uh, so, and once the ground rules stated that once we had reached a certain point, no new issues could be raised. Violating ground rules is potentially an unfair labor practice. So uh, some of those issues were, could not be addressed at the time that um, I showed up 16 months ago. So, but I think the change in practice is the most important aspect and to provide the training in a, uh, to administrators and build their confidence in dealing with these issues. 
And I would just say um, I am confident that with the consistent practices that we have employed and will continue to um, support administrators in the buildings in um, utilizing and the support of the employee and labor relations team, that there is um, no new or previous language in this contract that prevents us from upholding student safety as the center of um, what is important and ensures that we can also um, hold accountable ourselves and all employees within the district. I think it should be noted that um, these are practices that should probably that are going to apply across all employee groups, not just uh, one particular group. So um, you know, it's about having sort of a robust set of uh, practices that are consistently applied, and the district um, does its job well. And I'll take it back a step from the practices to the policies, and we are in the process of still revising some important policies that have bearing on this with our sexual harassment policies, which will come before board committee next week and hopefully before the board within about a month, which will clarify um, and make some revisions to current policies. But then to echo what Kylie's saying, the important piece there is how to make sure that that gets out into all of our buildings and that our administrators are really well supported in knowing exactly how to respond and what the policies are. Director Anthony? And if I could just build on what Mr. Cusack said uh, and direct this specifically to the superintendent. Uh, three issues that I see around this. Uh, one is the change uh, around tape recording meetings. Uh, another is uh, directing people with complaints to speak directly with the person with who they have an issue first. And the third is giving the name of a complainant to the person about whom they are complaining. Uh, I understand the circumstances that bring these issues up. Uh, I expect I know the intent of the district behind them, but on all three of these issues, to my certain knowledge, in the past they have put children at risk, in the past they have excluded families, particularly our most vulnerable families, from being able to participate in the process. I hope, I expect, that district administration is going to be giving building administration instruction, direction, ongoing support on how to deal with those issues competently, thoroughly, and uh, w with good judgment. There, there is a refresh in this contract on those particular issues. So, um, Director Anthony, I would first say that to your last assumption, the answer is yes, we will absolutely um, be um, ensuring that we uphold a consistent practice and support administrators in doing that. Um, in the complaint section um, of the contract, you referred to um, the language, the only change in that language is that it clarifies that the complainant does not need to be offered the opportunity to talk to um, the employee in question if the complaint involves allegations of sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I, I was trying to be brief, but I recognize that the language there is may, not necessarily will or or will not but it leaves open judgment on the part of the building administrator but not required. Uh, it, it, as, as director Constam just said they aren't necessarily required in, in, the, in the case of where the complaint involves allegations of sexual misconduct uh, is explicitly, explicitly, yeah, explicitly yeah. Forbidden. Yeah. yes the other areas not Correct. May. 
So I think, Director Anthony, whether it's this topic or any other changes in our agreement, for sure, we want to make sure that there's a uniform process by which um, our responses are applied, regardless of what school, regardless of what principal. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to need to do some, some refresh and some education on what are features in this contract so that the experience that any given teacher has in any building, and we spent a lot of time talking about this, we want to make sure that we minimize that variability. And we work with our principals, who I know also want to be dutiful and, uh, and, and, and do things in a correct fashion. And that's on us to make sure we're offering clarity of guidance in this area or any other. few questions, although everybody's ticking them off. Um, so I just want to go back to one issue that's been discussed earlier, and I just want a, just a clear question with a maybe short answer. So will this contract allow PPS to release the names of staff on paid leave? Uh, this contract does not address that issue. And then currently, PPS has a legal case against the citizen and reporter about access to records on staff on leave. Does this contract impact that case? No, it does not. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to get back into something that I'm, as a parent, much more interested in, is um, instructional days. Um, so if people don't mind if I change the topic. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak briefly to, um, there's been some confusion about this. Um, the, the previous contract had like a 90 plus, 190 plus two days. Um, and then um, we've change that to be 192. And can you talk about the difference between the guaranteed and the conditional of why there's been sort of this change? So we we could have had 178 days, but that was conditioned on some things happening. And um, so in this contact, we've moved away from putting conditions on it. And now it's a, there's a true base. Do you want to? So, Speak that, I'm, and yes, I'm sorry, it's yeah. a complicated issue, but I think it, there's been a lot of back and forth about mm -hmm. the topic, about whether... Um, the, the, the prior contract allowed for the district to add two instructional days to, for a total of 178 in any year in which it did not cut PA, the, the Teachers Association staff, and uh, which led to a, a case of, of um, where this year, since we did in fact cut the amount of PAT, PAT staff, that the two days could not be added. The new contract uh, removes the condition and simply increases the instructional days by one day. So that will be in the contract every year regardless of what actions uh, the board takes regarding budgeting. And uh, as the superintendent said, we're quite clearly looking at the early, start, uh, early releases and the late starts for additional instructional time um, we've had seven or eight uh, late starts and four early releases at the high school level. So that gets you back a day at the high school level and more than a day at the uh, two days at the elementary and middle school level. So in total, if we take those actions which are outside the contract um, in terms of the, the changing the early and lates, uh, we will in fact increase uh, get the instructional time back up to 178 or more, and that actually compares rather favorably with surrounding districts, many of who have um, a, a lot of um, er, like early, a lot of early releases and fewer instructional days. Yeah, I want to thank um, you all for putting together sort of a compar comparative of uh, districts. Um, the information provided by staff of Beaverton, Hillsborough, Portland, Tigard, and Gresham Barlow, and uh, we are at the top with the exception of Beaverton, but they also have um, early release or late opening um, every week, um, every which week. is quite substantial. Mm -hmm. So if we think in terms of instructional minutes, or hours. what's the impact? Right. The, um, well, the instructional hour over the course of the year, um, again, Laird talked about it in the equivalent of instructional um, days, but we have, um, with no change to late start or early close, we've increased our permitted or guaranteed instructional hours um, by a full school day, so six to um, six and three to seven. And then we, um, in consideration of the late starts and early closures, that would add an additional 16 hours back of instructional time at the elementary and middle school level and between eight and 10 hours 
hours back at the high school for a net overall gain of doing the math on the 24 hours so um, 24 hours on average between the elementary middle and high school a little bit and, more and I also want to just close the loop on this issue that there is a connection to what the superintendent referred to in the professional development days um, that are added to this contract because that's what those early those late starts and early releases were used for mm -hmm. that were valuable to our educators, particularly the equity work that took place then. So that um, also has found a home. Um, so just another question. Um, you earlier stated that uh, issues that weren't raised at the beginning um, there was an agreement that they wouldn't be raised later and there was ramifications if they were released. There were also, it's my understanding, um, some articles um, and TAs ag agreed to and voted on by the board um, last summer, or I, I think it was in last, spring. last spring. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just outline what those articles are, because I think, you know, in the community, when something stretches on so long, um, the sort of question of like what's changeable um, and you know what what's not or what had already been set in motion uh, part of the agreement and the ground rules at the beginning of bargaining was that uh, some of the agreements would be uh, voted on and uh, would be ratified by the parties uh, uh, during the course of bargaining um, and those if anybody wants to look at the actual detail you can go to the March 7 2017 board materials and it's all there uh, all the TAs are in there in their original form uh, the topics that were covered were uh, some language about moves which had become a real issue because we're moving people out of their high school teachers out of their high schools and redoing them and bringing them back in uh, so certain compensation for moving all their materials in and out issues like P cards notices notice of policy changes which frankly is appropriate under state law uh, some changes in leave, some of it to comply with uh, changes in federal law. Uh, we inc uh, moved up the evaluation schedule so the probationary teachers would be evaluated earlier and, and set dates for that so that there would be a longer period of time for those particularly who were in jeopardy to understand that that was the case and get more assistance. Um, so change in sick leave bank, some, uh, some changes in professional development. Um, the letters of expectation was uh, for, format was established. Um, we uh, renewed the Rosa Parks uh, year-round school agreement because they have slightly different rules because of the, the their school year, and uh, some uh, so those sorts of things. Uh, we also had uh, before that we had agreed to an MOA on the safety section that de dealt with a school climate and um, and some contract language changes in that the um, uh, that those were all time limited they basically said that they would be done by the time um, I think by the end of last year so we actually uh, bargained some more on those topics um, and uh, that that helped bargaining very much So um, earlier, and this is my question for the superintendent, um, and somewhat un unrelated to the contract, but I think in the, just the context of the instructional days, the family-friendly schedules that we referenced, that this is, um, a lot of it will be when the calendar is presented to the, the board and the community um, for for review that th those are many of those will be baked into that not necessarily into the contract agreement so that's true uh, pending tonight's uh, vote of course uh, we want to we have to produce a school calendar that incorporates all of those features so the planning days will want to put clarity right up front around our intention not to have late starts early dismissals Obviously, our teachers have uh, particular planning days for grading and other things. And of course, school vacations are important. Uh, we want to make sure there's clarity of understanding around when we may have a makeup for inclement weather, although we really haven't had any here this year. So I don't know what all the talk was about. So <laughs> we, still, we still got a little winter left. Yeah, still February. Um, 
But I am holding a prototype of the school calendar, just you know, thinking ahead around how we do that. Um, and so certainly there'll be uh, a lot there to, to review and to understand and how it all kind of comes together, I think, in a way that makes sense for, for, our, for our students and for our families. Um, my interest, of course, as an educator is to have five full instructional days that are uninterrupted for core instruction to take place. And I know our families, you know, probably don't want to be thinking about how, who's going to take my kid to school on Wednesday when it starts late? You know, all of those questions, I think, you know, are important to make sure we're doing what we can to not just promote learning, but also look out for our, fam our families. Uh, the other areas, and I've heard about these since I got here, is we have certain months of the school year that are pretty difficult and broken up with a lot of long weekends, which result in very short uh, work weeks. Uh, at the school level and so we want to try to remedy that as much as possible. I think we have a prototype that does that. Um, so I look forward to that discussion after tonight. So um, another f just follow-up question on uh, related to dual language immersion programs um, and the issue was raised about the need for translated materials in the classroom and given the uh, expansion of um, DLI in our uh, schools, um, teachers and parents had said there need to be greater access. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what the contract um, provided for, because um, I know that was a topic of discussion. So the um, addition in the contract specifically provides for um, professional educators who are teaching students in dual language immersion programs um, access to uh, district adopted curriculum materials in the language of instruction and provides um, the opportunity to agree with the Department of Dual Language uh, DLI on a mechanism to translate those if they are not currently available. Great. So just one last question, sorry. Um, so in the complaint section of the contract, what avenues um, does PPS have to address issues of um, misconduct? And just specific, is there specific language that was added or my understanding is that there very little language actually was changed to that. Uh, <clears throat> that, that is correct. Um, the, again, the district hadn't raised uh, changes in that area. The union did actually raise a number of, of uh, amendments that they were seeking. In the end, um, through a lot of conversation, we uh, didn't make uh, any, any changes in complaint process other than for the change we wanted regarding the not having to offer the meeting in the, in the cases of sexual misconduct. Uh, additionally, um, through a, a lot of conversation um, with uh, the Uniserves, uh, we, we're going to have an extended conversation about the difference between uh, complaints and investigations. Because um, there are often times in which there really isn't a complaint. There's just something we need to investigate. Someone didn't complain, they just gave us information. So we've agreed that we're going to have some additional conversations about uh, d dealing with those issues in the, in, as part of contract administration, which I think will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? You asked about family-friendly fri scheduling, Chair Brim Edwards. One, one not small thing that I think will matter to a significant number of our families uh, for students with disabilities uh, we want to make sure that as an IEP team we're making those meetings available uh, in a way that works for our parents and particularly when our educators are prepared and ready to meet in what might otherwise be their planning period we want to recognize that and so if they're giving up their prep period to be able to meet with families right after school we want to make sure and compensate for that uh, because otherwise they're going to do that hour of planning after the meeting so that's another feature. That'll allow more flexibility to work with parent schedules when they can come on campus for those important IEP meetings. Great. Uh, Director Anthony? Uh, I don't have any more questions, but I have a couple of comments. Uh, one is that I am very happy to see 
the class size goals going into the contract. Uh, that's enormously important to our parents, our students, our community, uh, and certainly our teachers. Uh, the other thing that's new that I think is absolutely marvelous is uh, the language on page 78 around letters of intent. Uh, for years, much longer than I have been on the board, I have been hearing about what a barrier the lack of those letters is in doing good recruiting. Uh, and I realize that to many people in the community, it seems like these incremental moves we are making, moving up the time when we do hiring, and now with letters of intent, uh, it feels like very little progress, particularly around recruiting teachers of color. But we are chasing, uh, our, our HR department I know <laughs> is chasing after a very, very small pool of people and we need to give them every edge that we can. And if we don't make these changes, uh, we're just cutting ourselves off at the knees. Uh, so that's something I think we should certainly be celebrating. Well, thank you for highlighting those two areas. Director Anthony, if you rewind the game tape, if you recall a number of months ago upon my arrival, there was testimony here around Superintendent Guerrero. You've been in a couple of districts that really emphasized class size as an important factor, and I hope I, we've delivered on that here and recognizing that. Um, and then secondly, to your point around having an ability to recruit the best and brightest talent to come to Portland Public Schools, I think this gives us yet another tool to be able to do that. Some of us were with some of our business leaders earlier today, and this was something that they expressed. We want the best people we can find in front of our children, and I think this is just one more means to be able to do that. Great. I think, uh, do you want to... Um, are these questions, or we're getting close to moving to statements? Um, so I want I think I want to get um, what happened to Roseanne. She's been traumatized by me earlier. <laughs> uh, let's let's get Julie on on the phone maybe for this last portion. I um, also want to note uh, for board members that um, we received, um, and you should have a copy in your inbox. Um, if you, I know some some of you already looked at it. Um, the uh, Society for Professional Journalists, is that, do I have the correct, is that the right sure. name? Um, has submitted some testimony uh, for the board's consideration. We got it this afternoon. Julie, you're at the board meeting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, Julie, um, our director, Sparza Brown, we just have um, spent some time. Uh, we had a presentation by Superintendent Guerrero. Uh, we had. Oh, wow. It's hard to hear. Sorry. Um, Hang in there. We'll just do our best and proceed. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should put that more in the middle. Is that possible to pass it down? Wireless or is it connected? Can't go very far, actually. Yeah. So maybe Amy, could you just tell her, um, Director Constam, can you uh, just share? We've quick had recap what we've gone done? through a lot of questions. We have the resolution um, on the floor. I think we're just going to solicit any comments that board members have and proceed to a vote. Okay. I think my comments are around. I'm thrilled that we're we're here because yes our teachers do need a contract and I'm so appreciative of the, the whole um, bargaining team for getting us where we're at and for Guadalupe's leadership. Um, I'm particularly happy to see some of the um, 
provisions that are uh, put in place for special education teachers um, in terms of some added supports for them. Um, so that I think that was really important um, as we continue to do this work at, 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 you know, finding the ways to best educate all of our students. Um, I'm going to continue to track. Um, I think there were some provisions, some discussion also about uh, for bilingual teachers in terms of giving them support for translating materials. Um, I think we need to continue to have a laser focus on um, our dual language programs and making sure that we provide um, um, the you know adequate curriculum for teachers as well. Um, but again, I think that this is really a step forward. So thank you all for your hard work to get us here. Thank you, Director Sparza Brown. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask um, the veteran of this, uh, Dr. Constam, if you want to make some comments since you, you were here when it all began. <laughs> uh, so the, the only thing I wanted to comment on was just the tenor of the talks over the long trajectory and we spent a lot of time at the beginning um, really learning about and engaging in interest-based bargaining which is a, a way of uh, having dialogue that is really about what are what are your concerns and interests that you are bringing to this what are your stories what are your experiences which is a little bit different than starting with a an inherently oppositional framework which is this is what I'm trying to get well, this is what I'm trying to get over here, and then meet in the middle, which is, I think, a layperson's characterization, ca characterization of traditional bargaining. So we spent a lot of time in that, and I think um, in the middle of the process, we got away from it, and it uh, looked and felt more like traditional bargaining, but I really feel like at the end, it came back to the original ideals of interest-based bargaining, and having a much more open dialogue and that in the end it was pretty clear that we had much more in common than we had differences in terms of what we were all looking for for our students from our different roles and I would say that that was really a three-legged stool of the the union and the teachers that they represent and our superintendent and his administrative team and the values that the board brought forward into the process. Um, and in the end, they were really um, very common. We had some different, different ideas about how we wanted to address some of these problems, but we all really recognized the points where this system is in real need of reform. And the one area I want to highlight in particular is that we have a roadmap for really building a um, much stronger, more responsive system of supports for all of our students, academic and social emotional. Some of the specific um, issues around our special education students um, come to bear in this, but it really is something that is needed for all of our students um, at, at every level. And I know this is some work that Dr. Curtis has been charged with um, and others with really building out in our system. And the absence of that is what has allowed kids to fall through the cracks in our system, in my opinion. So um, I just wanted to speak to that and um, also to say that uh, with those systems of support for our students, we also spend a lot of time talking about systems of support for our educators and what does meaningful professional development really look like, professional development that is going to bear good results for our kids and their achievement. And um, those discussions were fruitful, but I think also uh, the ideas that really the superintendent put forth about how he intends to use that precious time with teachers um, in those professional development days and, and school meetings is really where we are going to move things forward. So uh, you know, I can make No, go ahead, Julie. No, I just wanted to make one more comment, Amy, since uh, Dr. Constam, since you reminded me about the original, I was on an original team that did use that interest-based bargaining um, over a year ago, um, and we talked about a rapid response team. So to provide support 
for teachers and, and schools when you know students were um, ha- having crises and um, needed support outside of just the, uh, the school staff. And so we're, at a, we're, we're working towards funding that. I think we're, we're realizing now, you know, the fruits of those, that early bargaining, too, which is critically mm-hmm. important to, to have services for students that need um, kind of uh, above and beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Director Anthony, do you have some comments? Uh, I don't have any more comments, but there is a very important issue, and I'm hoping Superintendent Guerrero or Ms. Rogers, you could speak to it. Uh, the language on page, uh, let's see, 149, limiting turnover, which for some of our schools has become a huge problem. Yes. Um, so the language on page 149 talks specifically about a joint commitment um, to work together to identify the schools that have high turnover um, to understand what the root cause of um, that turnover is and to really explore and identify solutions to um, reduce that turnover and to um, keep our educators in those schools um, uh, supporting students there. So I I think this really just represents, again, um, what Director Constam um, talked about, about a system that we really need to build a lot of supports into, and that includes supports for our educators um, in looking at how we retain, not just attract the best educators, but retain the best educators in those schools. Uh, Director Esparza Brown, could you put your f- phone on mute unless you're speaking? Sorry. Thank you. Director Moore? Um, I joined the bargaining team about um, almost eight months ago now. Um, and I have to say, at the beginning, it was uh, a bit of a slog. Um, I think I came in when we were in the middle of um, the the traditional bargaining mode, um, which is something less than scintillating, um, and and frankly didn't feel all that productive, Um, and um, and then it changed, and it changed when. when we got some new people, and in particular when we got Superintendent Guerrero. Um, what were you guys talking about all that time? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. Sharing, <laughs> sharing stories. Um, so I, I think this is, uh, I, I'm thrilled with this contract. Um, it, it, you know, obviously I wasn't involved in previous ones. Um, I was on the sidelines during previous ones, and my my perception in the past was that getting to an agreement in a contract was um, painful in this district and it was always kind of 11th hour somebody pulls a rabbit out of a hat and it's a really ugly rabbit and nobody's happy but at least we were done Um, and that's pretty much the best anybody could say about it Um, and this was different um, I, I, I think the last, I, I mean, in a way, um, th- there was, th- there was the, um, pre-Guerrero and the post-Guerrero. And the, the, um, the, the portion of the negotiations that happened, um, since October were, um, were completely different in tone on both sides. Um, and, and we started talking about you know, okay. Let me let me say. I, I I suspect during the initial, you know, IBB, the interest-based bargaining. Um, my impression is that a lot of discussions were happening about really critical issues, and and some really good work was done. Uh, and then we had that lull, and then we started talking about the important stuff again. Um, and we were talking about um, issues that I have heard about from teachers 
for years. Um, and in, in way more detail than I had ever experienced before. Um, um, I, we were talking about things that I'd heard uh, for years from administrators in this building um, in way more detail than I had ever experienced. Um, and, um, but we weren't talking about, we weren't talking about things in the abstract. I mean, people were, people were telling stories about real life actual children and how we can serve them better. Um, and, um, and it was, uh, to, to the extent a, a negotiation can be thrilling, it was. Um, and um, at the end of it, um, those last few days were extraordinarily long. Um, but at the end of it, everybody was smiling. Um, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen in the past. Um, and I, I think this is, the, I think this is a groundbreaking contract in many ways. Um, it's groundbreaking for the state of Oregon because we are talking about why class size matters and what we can do about it. Um, I, as a parent, um, of a kid in this district, um, I know how important um, class size has been, and um, and we have had problems, um, and we are we have made a commitment to pay attention to class sizes and do what we can to make sure that class sizes are manageable for teachers and for students. Um, it's also groundbreaking for this district because I, I sincerely hope this is the beginning of a completely new era. Um, I, I, I hope the days of um, district and teachers being on opposite sides, um, yelling at each other and, and, and forgetting that we're actually both in it for the same purpose, to serve kids. Um, those days are over, I hope. Um, and it's now up to all of us to live, live up to the promise of this contract. Um, and I, you know, I'm hopeful that we're all going to do it. Um, and the last thing I'll say is this contract is just one piece. This, this is a huge district. Um, this is just one union. We have many, many others. Um, and this is just one lever. Um, we have work to do um, in central office administration. Um, a lot of it has already started. A lot more has to happen. Um, we are already seeing the impact of, um, I think, huge changes that have happened in the HR department, thanks to new people. Um, I think that's going to make an enormous difference. Um, we've we've got new people in curriculum and instruction, and um, uh, things are happening. It may take a while for a lot of those changes to become visible to parents and students out there, but they're happening. And um, I, I'm, th I've said this before, I'll say it again. This is the very first time in the entire time I have been paying attention to PPS that I am actually optimistic. We can do this. We're going to do better for kids. So thank you to everybody who was involved. It's all been said. I just want to say thank, thank you the, for, to both teams, speaking to both banks. Can I speak out of both sides of my mouth at the same time? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you. And I agree this, uh, this is a big step going forward, not only for what's in the contract, uh, but the spirit in which uh, where we ended up so that's that's good Director Rosen? yeah I um, wanted to say thank you specifically to directors Constan Moore and Brim Edwards I mean you guys put in countless hours it's mind-boggling how much um, how hard you worked on this and I really appreciate it I want to thank um, the union for all your hard work. I know you spent equal amount of countless hours and you went through some rough patches, but you hung in there. And then um, Superintendent Guerrero and Laird and Kylie and Antonio, um, I know you were put in, everyone put in an incredible number of hours. 
And I want to thank um, all the board members for their good questions. That was really, um, we, I think we had a good discussion tonight. And then finally, I want to thank the public and the parents and the press who in 72 hours came up with about a dozen good questions. And, um, you know, we didn't change the contract, but we um, clarified a lot of important points that I hope will satisfy all the parties. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Student Representative Tran, do you want to? Um, I would just like to thank everyone involved. I think um, this contract is monumental for our district. Um, it just shows a token of appreci appreciation um, from students that um, the district and uh, the PAT have the best interests of teachers at heart um, and that if we can support our teachers um, better and then we can support our students better um, and really shows um, um, how this district is moving forward to bring students um, first. I had one note that I forgot to say, which is that I think a lot of the momentum that we were able to grab onto toward the end of this process was due to our superintendent really showing up as a teacher, as a lifelong educator. And um, I think that was very clear to all of our teacher friends and union leadership and it's what um, helped catalyze ideas around innovative solutions to what had been pretty intractable problems or conflicts. Um, but I think uh, that was really the, the guiding light that, that landed this contract and that led that process. Thank you, Director Constam. Um, so, Unless anybody else has some other comments, I'm just going to close out. Um, so this was my third time participating on a bargaining team. And uh, to Regis' point, I was part of those um, times when the, the ugly rabbit <laughs> got pulled out. Um, but it was the only one in the hat. Um, so we did what we had to do. Um, and so I would say, you know, I wasn't there at the beginning, um, but certainly there when it was a little, um, you know, it wasn't clear that we were going to get to a, um, a good a good moment and something that would work for um, both our teachers and our students. Um, and I think we, you know, worked through it as we should. And I think that's a great, um, it'll be a great model for going forward that we're not always going to agree, but that um, we have the capacity to listen to each other, understand, try and understand each other's perspectives um, and get to a better place. Um, so I'm going to support this agreement tonight um, because it has wins for students and teachers and it will allow us to move forward in partnership with our teachers on some very um, important issues that we need to tackle. Um, so, you know, wins for students and parents, more guaranteed instructional time for students, more time for teachers to plan and prepare their work, um, more time for teachers to participate in professional development. That's, at the end of the day, it may be teacher focused, but the, the beneficiary are our students. Um, there'll be a focus on class sizes and workloads so that students and teachers have opportunities for more personalized instructions. And, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure class size matters to every student, but for some students it really matters to get that personalized attention. And I think it is going to make a difference for students who in the past, um, because of workloads or class size, haven't been able to receive that. Um, so as a as a parent, those are all aspects of the contract that I find to be very student-centered and supportive also of helping our t teachers do their job well, which we all should care about. Um, am I happy with everything in the contract and the di did the district prevail in every instance? No, but that's what negotiations and mediation is about. It's about finding common ground. Um, I just w I want to sort of briefly say that you know we've had many questions about our public records policy section of the agreement as the chair of the committee considering revised complaint policy and the public records policy, they're issues that we take seriously and we'll move ahead with the work on those. Um, but I, I should note that as we would have done regardless of what was in the contract, we will consult with and want to hear the perspective of all our employee groups because um, they have something to add, they can provide key insights and um, we're, we're, we're always going to want to hear from um, staff and and teachers on on any policy that we're creating um, because we're a whole school community and they um, have things to add to um, the discussion that are valuable 
so from my perspective, this contract lays a foundation for the work ahead between our teachers and um, our district. And I think it really gives us a roadmap to do some great things. So I'm delighted at this time um, to say that the, the board is now going to vote on resolution um, 5569. As amended. As amended. Thank you, um, Liz. Uh, Julie, if you want to take your uh, phone off um, mute, we're going to get ready to vote. And I'm going to, oh. do people want to have a roll call vote? Can you or hear they me? Wanna, yeah, yeah, we can't hear you. Do you want a roll call vote? Or? Okay. okay uh, I'm sorry? We're doing a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hewson, please call the roll. Director Rosen. Um, yes. Director Bailey. Yes. Director Moore. Yes. Director Anthony. Yes. Director Constan. Yes. Director Esparza Brown. Director. Yes. Chair Brim Edwards. Yes. And Student Representative Tran. Yes. I'm delighted to say that uh, the, mo the resolution passes <laughs> seven to zero with student representative Tran voting yes. Um, and I think it's appropriate to end this um, evening with um, by asking if you're interested, um, our, our partner in the process, um, Suzanne Cohen, the uh, president of PAT. Um, this is really an exciting day and thank you all for your comments it really has um, almost all been said and I really appreciate it of course I want to thank all the board directors because I know that you all volunteer but especially those that served on the bargaining team um, especially for so long um, and of course thank our bargaining team and really all the teachers who were very very patient during a very difficult time with a lot of uncertainty um, around what direction this district was going to take. Our own bargaining team lost two members to um, other districts as we started looking at, at comparables. And um, I'm really, really excited to be at the place that we are now. For a long time, we had, um, you've heard us say, a, a better day before a longer year. And as you, you hear about the two days and only before cutting staffing, that might sound selfish, but what we are at the heart of, that, that staff, is those reasonable class sizes and caseloads. It's our media specialists, it's art, it's counselors. So it's everything we know that goes into a really great school day. And we wanted to have as much of those really great school days as possible. But we never wanted to compromise on what a better day meant. This class size language is the everything in that direction that we were hoping for. And no, these numbers are not the best numbers ever, but they are a step. And I really, you know, a lot of um, talk is about uh, Superintendent Guerrero and, and the catalyst for change. And I'm sorry about OPB, but we needed you there, and we wanted you there, and it did change when you were there. And your experience as an educator, it re the tone really did change, because where we talked, and yes, we made you listen, and we talked and talked, when we had a partner who could hear it and understood it and was ready to do stuff about it, especially around class size, where we had been met for over and over again um, that that was just something we were not going to discuss, we weren't going to talk about it. And then we had someone who said, if this is important to you, then let's talk about it. And it is important to us, and as has been stated, it's really important to our students and to our families. We wear our shirts, we say that we're fighting for the schools Portland students deserve and this is the next step in that direction, but also this is a step in fighting for the schools that Oregon students deserve. We now have an opportunity to be even prouder to be a part of PPS because we are the first school district in Oregon to really talk about class size, which we know matters. And now as the state is looking at a bill around this very issue, I would just encourage everyone to know that the big turning point when we talked about you know, mediation or strike or implementing, it was the willingness to have a conversation about what we care about. And so I really thank you and applaud you for not being afraid to talk about that very important issue. Uh, our bargaining chair, Steve Lancaster, regrets that he had to leave, but I'm, I will not be nearly as um, well-spoken as he is with his comments, but he wanted, as we close the chapter 
of, of negotiations, what we're really just embarking on is, is the next step. You, I've testified, we, we wanna see it in writing, and now we have that. And the next goal is to make sure that that contract's being followed and has been spoken. We have struggled with that effort. As many PAT members ask me, like, how do you know? How do you know that you can trust? Um, and we have nothing to gain and no benefit if we don't trust and believe at this point. We have commitments, and it is up to us to make sure we're following them and doing the right stuff. But in the spirit of negotiations and everything that we've done together, I really, really am optimistic, and I'm excited about the collaboration. I'm excited about the work ahead of us. Uh, this is a very, very new contract with a lot of new issues, and so of course our reps and our administrators will all need to make sure that we understand how this works and the, and the true intent behind it, and that's why I really appreciate you being at the bargaining table because you understand the intent behind it. Um, I know we all uh, need a, a great <laughs> little rest right now, and I'm excited about this opportunity and the cause for celebration. And then I should say that I'm really, really excited about the next steps that this contract gets and moving forward together to, to just keep working on making sure that Portland Public Schools really is the schools that all our students deserve. So thank you, um, thank you to everybody, and thank you to our wonderful, wonderful students who are really always in our hearts and minds as we have any of these conversations. So thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. So with that, unless there's anything else, I'm, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>